All right, well, welcome to today's afternoon session. And we're going to start with our first presentation, Stronger Together, Developing a Conference to Establish Relationships and Advocacy to Support OER and Dual Enrollment. Take it away, presenter. Thank you, Ursula. I am Charlotte Daly, Program Specialist for OER at the Southern Region Education Board. And I thought it would be helpful to share uh, some tips that we learned while developing a new conference for the organization. A new conference that supports OER and dual enrollment. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see it? Okay, all right. So Stronger Together, developing a conference to establish relationships and advocacy in support of OER and dual enrollment. So this is a conference toolkit that was submitted to Spark for a capstone in completion of a leadership program earlier this year. And so I thought it would be helpful to share some of the hiccups and along the way of developing a new conference. So SREB's OER initiative is a part of a larger effort funded by the William and uh, Flora Hewlett Foundation. There are five parts to this effort, each lying within a, a region of the United States. So all four regional education compacts are engaged along with SREB. We have WICHI, the Western Interstate Compact. We have the Midwestern, um, Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And we also have the New England Board of Higher Education, as well as WCET for the first part of phase one. So this conference was developed in, co in collaboration with the entire group called NCOER, or the National Consortium of OER. So the learning objectives for our con for conference were set with the entire group. And they were to define the conference objectives, the audience we wanted to target, the duration, the resources, themes, because all of that for a first time conference we decided would be very important on who we draw, draw, were able to draw first out of the pandemic and to the southern region of Atlanta. That's where we, uh, this conference was began was where it begun. So to construct the agenda, select the topics, establish a venue, publicize, and evaluate all the learning objectives that we'll discuss, we'll discuss here in a minute. So developing a program model. The recommendations that came from this section was to consult industry leaders on major topics for your agenda. As an organization, we felt we knew what we wanted to share with people, but what did people really want to hear from us and the other compacts who were involved? So by consulting the industry leaders around the country, we were able to come up with a different mix of subject matters and then discuss subject matter experts to give the keynote address to draw a bigger, uh, larger audience. So connect with your state, regional, national organization to show collaboration across the board and always make sure to engage senior leadership in order to tie your events to organizational goals. So the audience. We began with groups served by our organization and the organizations that were in collaboration with our colleagues and other uh, education compacts. We replicated any existing timelines that maximized audience attention. And what I mean by that is that when, we, when developing the agenda, we didn't go with an agenda that just pushed in as much information as possible spread over three days or two days. We went with something that was successful in our organization that was a day and a half with a uh, welcome reception coming in the day four, before. So this is what our evaluation had told us was working in other events. So we tried using the same timeline. So you calculate your expected number of attendees and monitor your registration closely. Since we did not have this event in the past, we used the calculation of expecting 55% of a response from the amount, the number of invites you send. And from that 55% return rate of responses, we only expected about 30% to actually respond to the registration. And maybe out of that 30%, 
we would see a 75% attendance rate from that. So that's how we got our numbers on down as to how many to expect, in which we targeted that we would expect around 100 people. And um, we actually maxed out at about a mm, total of 89. So we were only off by a few. So the schedule smaller concurrent sessions if you want more in-depth conversations and to allow the audience to really have um, intimate conversations with the practitioners in these rooms. So if you have programs that you want to highlight or uh, share best practices or, or emerging practices, have consider having those in a smaller concurrent session rather than in a major room session so you can have more intimate conversation. So your location of venue should not be selected until you have a good idea of how many people you're going to have. If you go ahead and book the largest space available and you get it on the contract and you only end up bringing in half your attendees, attrition is a real thing that hotels will charge you or event uh, venues will charge you. So if you judge an amount of rooms that you're going to have and you go with 100 rooms per night and you only secure 25, there is an attrition amount that will be charged to you in addition to what you actually have to pay for for not meeting your target goals. So be very careful when selecting your venue. Um, make it as adequate as possible for the number of attendees. Make sure your venue is easily accessible. So if you have people traveling from the country into your city, you want to consider something that's, that's easily transport. The, the transportation is easy, and once they get there, are your are, does your venue or your hotels do they provide shuttles? Some cities, if you have events downtown, there are no shuttle services to those hotels. So all of these should be considered. And I would suggest having an audiovisual vendor on site because this is a very very important cost within your budget. It is not cheap to have your audio visual for your event. It is a separate cost now uh, from your event venue. It's normally a contractor for the event venue itself. And if having that person on site, they will be able to help you with any problems you may have along the way. And also make sure that you have satisfactory meal selection. We're in the south in Atlanta, so we make sure that people get to experience a little southern charm when they come our way. So you can share your home uh, selections as well. Marketing and promotion. Create your conference web presence and landing page. Make sure it is engaging. Show a showcase of picture of the city in which your event will be held. Post an outline of your agenda when available. Even if you don't have the exact speakers, show timelines so your guests or, or possible attendees can see times that they will have to be in session or maybe they'll have a little bit of time to get out or build in some time where they might be able to see your city. One thing I always do is leave the evening open for them to have dinner on their own. That way they get to get out on your own on, in the city and they can spot that time in advance of coming so they won't be looking for time to disappear during the day in between sessions. So develop your registration portal early in the process. We selected a venue of a, a, a vendor to handle our registration that was easily accessible for us so we could download uh, registration reports every day. At your hotel and accommodations as soon as available, design engaging social media pr promotions because even as educational organizations, social media is so important in our society. That's how we got most of the people uh, who came to our event attracted either through LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Twitter is very popular. Uh, but we also did some Instagram and some Snapchat, Snapchat as well. Do news releases about everything you think the public will want to hear. So get your communications officers involved early on in your process. Sponsorships. If you can get sponsorships, it, it, it cuts down on the amount of money your organization has to spend. So not just exhibitors. Exhibitors, of course, you will assign a, a, a cost to exhibitors. But sponsors, I started with our vendors, our top level vendors. Um, so. You know, sending out a letter of sponsorship and developing a sponsorship scale, you may want to start at your gold level at, at uh, 5,000, your silver level at silver level at 2,500, and uh, on down at, you know, at lesser amounts. Or, excuse me, you may want to go bigger. It just depends on how well um, you think your, if this is a new event, how well your event will be um, 
received by potential sponsors because everyone is looking for a way to get the word out about their product or service. So staffing, I know I put this at the end, but I started off with collaborating. So consider when you're building a staff to work your conference, you want to make sure that the people who were involved early on in the planning are there to greet. You want to have as much conversation with your attendees as possible. Make them feel at home. Try to liven the feeling so they won't feel tense about arriving to a new event or a new city, depending on where you're having your event. Plan adequate staff to cover registration. Registration is always set up 30 minutes prior to your, your expectation time for arrivals that morning. If you're doing name tags, it's a good idea to have them already already done, already alphabetized and sitting up where they can see them. And whatever your materials are, have everything planned so it's easy. And in this time of COVID, we wanted to make sure that people could pass through the line as quickly as possible without any bottlenecks. So again, arrange for your audio visual people to arrive 30 minutes to an hour before your event begins to work through any hiccups. And this is, this is before any session. Equipment some can sometimes develop hiccups in between sessions. So you want to test at, at the beginning of every session if possible. Post the person near your presenters for your table or your stage to assist with any needs while engaging the audience. Sometimes they need water, they need tissue, they need different things. And so plan for that in advance so they won't have to look for someone to assist them in the middle of a presentation. Provide all event staff with basic information to keep guests informed of any changes. Have an assigned announcer, if you, if you will, for who will announce, make all of your announcements, your, your schedule changes or anything. Make sure they are ready, have a pleasing voice, and are ready to address the the audience at every break. Designate a person to interact with venue staff while the event is in progress. You don't want a lot of information coming from several different people at one time. So designate a per person who is going to be your liaison with the event venue. Last but surely not least, you want to do a thorough program evaluation. Develop and test your evaluation process and procedures well in advance of your event. So if you're going to do it, do Google Drive, I, that's one of the things we, I developed and our organization decided to do was Google so everyone could, it could come in and it could be in a spreadsheet that we could easily manipulate the data around to see. But make sure that you ask questions about your event, temperature of the room, size of the room, were the chairs comfortable, if the event was in a place, a location that was easily accessible, uh, was the meals, were the meals okay, if the information the presenters, presenters seemed knowledgeable about their uh, information they were sharing. Make sure you ask every relevant question because when you look at that data and you start to analyze it, it will really inform you on your future events. Meet with organizers as soon as you can to decide how the evaluations will be will inform organizational leaders. Uh, preparing a post-event report was helpful for us. We prepared the post-event report and shared it with all of the collaborators and our senior leaders. And we used our evaluations to inform future decisions. As a matter of fact, we're using that post-event report to develop our upcoming um, OER and dual enrollment conference, which will be held March 1st and 2nd, for those who want to know, of 2023. Any questions? Charlotte, this was so great. I want to recruit you for Open Texas 2023. <laughs> so many great ideas here. And it's funny because it made me think about when we started to plan last year's, we were planning to have it in person in Houston and then I mean, two years ago, and, and then everything happened. So, wow, this is very comprehensive, this toolkit. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And if anyone, uh, there is a toolkit. It's already, it's, it was submitted to Spark, but it's being edited by our organization now. So if you would like a copy of the toolkit, just email me. Could you repeat what you said about the attendance calculation? So it values, but it, it varies, but yes. The one that I've always used in the past was, if I sent out 500 um, in invites, only expect a response from 55% of the people of the number you invite. So when you get that about 55%, you start back at 100% of your responses. You're only going to get probably about 30% mm, 
of the original. So, so you you could dip, you could if you would look at the original 500, it would go like this: 55 expect 55 percent response, expect 30 percent of the original invite number to actually do something, to actually either register, email you questions or whatever, and then finally you'll get anywhere from 25 to 27 percent that are actually. Uh, show up because everyone who registers don't show up so you'll get about 30 percent to do something and so once you do that that's the formula that has always worked for me and this time by using that formula we came in at 89 we we planned for 100 we targeted 100 and we came in about 89. John I see you unmuted yourself did you have a question? Um, I, I did actually um so I, I'm actually leading an OER uh I'm one of the leads, um, you know, in, in and around Houston College, and also I'm, I'm the carryover for OER um, for the COMREC uh, in California and everything. And so I, I wanted to follow up with you, Ms. Daly, and, and do you have a, a contact email that maybe I could reach out to you? I sure do. Uh, you want to put it in the chat or and then I can I could reach for out? For some to reason, you. I can't. My. Um, hmm. My screen won't advance, but it's, it's actually the next slide. There it is. <laughs> and Texas, Texas is in our service area. So if you're in Texas, you know, we service the 16, we service the 16 southern states, SREB does. But if you're not in our service area, that's okay too, because in collaboration with this grant, we service the entire nation. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, giving me your contact info. I appreciate that. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Well, if not, thank you, Ursula, for being a great moderator. Thank you all for having me in Open Texas. This is my first time presenting here. And so, hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That was great. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Learned a lot from that. Um, if you want to stop, sh stop sharing your screen. Great. Um, we're going to have a five minute break and the next session will begin at 225. It is, um, explore, create, and collaborate how the OER values inspired a cross department collaboration. So we'll start in five minutes with that. Thank you very much. Okay, there, <laughs> I began it. Um, and um, so welcome to today's session. Um, this second presentation is Explore, Create, and Collaborate, how uh, the OER values inspired a cross-department collaboration. Take it away, presenters. Okay, thank you so much. We are so excited to be here from UTSA today um, to talk about some of our uh, projects and partnerships that we're working on. Um, collaborations between the library, the libraries and academic innovation. Um, and just, yeah, we're going to introduce ourselves on this next slide. So I'll hand it over to Claudia um, and Myra. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Claudia Arcolin. I'm the executive director for teaching and learning uh, experiences at academic innovation. And uh, in my role, I oversee faculty professional development and course design, and I pass it over to Myra. Oh, Myra, I think you're muted. I can, I can go. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, there we go. We can hear okay. you. Okay, sorry awesome. about that. Um, my name is Myra Collins. I'm the instructional design manager. Um, and in my role, I oversee the design and development of online courses for both residential and online programs. And I'm Deanne Ivey. I'm the OER coordinator at the UTSA Libraries. I'm also the political science librarian, and I work with um, our amazing team that's here today and um, our subject librarians to advance um, and promote and, and help with, uh, you know, 
faculty adopting OER. Okay, I will go ahead and start, and I'll start by sharing some key information about our uh, about our institution. So UTSA has almost 35 students, 35,000 students enrolled. For 45% of our undergraduates, undergraduates will be the first in their families to earn a bachelor's degree. Uh, we have also recently received a significant milestone for UTSA strategic vision, as we have received the status of a tier one research in, uh, university, and we couldn't be more proud of that. Uh, when it comes to our student population, when it comes to gender, our student population is pretty much evenly distributed with 47% male and 50% uh, female students. 57% uh, of our undergraduate uh, enrollment is Hispanic. 22% are white, 8% are African-American, and 12% represent different ethnicities. Our student population represents uh, about 90 countries. Um, the majority of the students, 85% um, are undergraduate, 11% uh, are master's students, 3% are doctoral students and 1% are postdoctorate. The colleges with the most students enrolled are health, community, and policy with 19.3% of the student enrollment, followed by business, college of business with 18%, and sciences with almost 15% of the total student enrollment. When it comes to our faculty, we have 1,389 faculty. The College of Sciences and the College of Liberal and Fine Arts have the most faculty with 281 and 277 each. Of our faculty, 34% um, are tenured and 13% are on tenure track. Inclusivity is one of the core values for UTSA. And if we consider our uh, strategic plan for the upcoming uh, 10 years, we want to create equitable learning experiences for our faculty and our students. So in line with uh, this core value and uh, these goals, we have implemented a couple of initiatives that uh, prioritize open educational resources as a key component for uh, our initiatives. For example, Academic Innovation has launched the Teaching and Learning Reimage grants. Uh, we had the first uh, iteration, first cohort of this program uh, last fall, and uh, we encourage faculty to uh, include open educational resources into their course design and teaching strategy. The libraries also promoted a, uh, a series of grants to adopt a free textbook. And uh, our final goal is to create uh, experiences and um, actionable steps, initiatives to model student success. So um, if we go to the next slide, we can take a look to the timeline and some of the major initiatives we implemented. So at the end, I pass it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, yeah, so we we were trying to capture and pull together kind of the evolution of, of OER and kind of where we are right now. So you can see on this slide, um, and these are, some of these are like the adopt a free textbook program through the library or teaching and learning grants through Imagine. You can kind of see we launched those in spring um, uh, when we started the adopt a free textbook grants. Um, we joined as an OpenStax partner in 2015, and um, that was something that was really helpful that um, provided a really nice framework for us where we could connect with other, um, you know, other institutions that were exploring advancing OER, um, and it was really exciting and so helpful. Um, to help us get started with that. Um, we've seen um, really nice growth um, with our um, grant program, the Adopt a Free Textbook grant program through the library, um, where we offer those every year. And we usually have about 30 that we award. This year we had a decrease in the number of grants that we could award, but that's because we were um, uh, partnering with our amazing team in academic innovation to help provide um, support for OER design. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of the evolution of, 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 of our uh, progress with OER. I think an important thing to note, um, some of the things that really stand out to me um, is in 
the summer of 2021, um, we had two um, coordinating board grants that our faculty received. And so with those grants, um, we actually, uh, Academic Innovation and the library um, uh, are currently continuing to pro provide cost share supports for those grants. Um, and so that's been really fun and just really exciting to be a part of supporting our faculty um, with those external grants. Um, and then one of the other things I'll mention, um, we are working on, this is another great partnership that we have, our two teams, is we're working on creating um, certificate courses for our faculty that are awarded um, through the, the library grant program where they can um, get a certificate in the end and they learn these key skills about you know, Creative Commons licensing and where to get help with that and um, how to use press books um, and all of those great skills that they need whenever they are um, adopting and designing OER. And I'll hand it off to, I think uh, Claudia or Myra has this slide. Uh, there are different ways that academic innovation supports OERs. Uh, academic innovation oversees the management of the Blackboard LMS and provides support for the integration of the OERs. UTSA is also an Adobe Creative Campus, and our team provides training for the use of Adobe tools to create multimodal content. We also have a, a team of accessibility specialists working with our faculty to ensure that all content is accessible. And the teaching and learning consultants provide training on the creation and management of digital content and provide suggestions for different assessments and learning activities using OERs. Um, if we can go to the next slide, um, I'll talk about also about um, the design and development team in academic, innov academic innovation supports faculty in the design and development of their online courses. So through our course transformation process, we utilize the instructor's vision teaching style and the class characteristics to provide uh, class instructions and expectations for students, a meaningful combination of course materials and activities, um, strategies that include transparent and culturally responsive assignments, promote the digital fluency by using different digital tools and technologies that help students, and strategies that promote interaction among students, students with faculty and with the content. Um, we also design all course elements with accessibility and usability in mind. And by using OERs, we are designing equity-centered courses that reduce economic barriers, making content accessible to all students, regardless of their economic background. In addition, we're designing courses that support multimodal learning, giving students different, with different styles, um, language, or cultural differences, or even disabilities, a different way to learn the content. Um, in my experience, when faculty want to use OERs is because they want the content that they can edit and fit into course objectives, that, that fit into their own course objectives and teaching style that addresses the needs of our students. And number, and number one, because they want to ensure that they are for uh, affordable education for all students. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it to um, again. Yeah, thank you so much, Myra. Um, so these are some of the ways that um, UTSA Libraries supports um, OER advancement at UTSA. Um, some of these probably look familiar um, to some of you in the audience. You probably do these, uh, provide these services at your libraries as well. Um, but we have research guides that we create for faculty that have OER for certain courses, especially high enrollment courses. Um, we help with providing any guidance or answering questions around Creative Commons licenses or um, just copyright in general. Um, and we do have librarians that are uh, Creative Commons certified that have um, you know, taken that course. So they have that, that great knowledge base to help with that. Um, and then just guiding on that process, redistributing the OER, um, and then helping our uh, faculty share the OER for widest impact. And just to give you a quick snapshot of our grant program um, through the library, we have awarded 138 grants to date, um, starting in 2016. Um, we have an ROI return on investment of $48 for every dollar spent, and we've invested 207,000. Some of this was from donor uh, donors. Um, a large chunk of it was from the library's budget 
um, as well. So our student savings, we're really proud of that. We just hit um, 10 million um, this year with our latest uh, round of uh, grants that were awarded in the spring. So um, the little screenshot that you see at the bottom is just, um, we recently retiered the grants and now we have um, no cost OER adoption and OER design. And this was just something that we did to better help educate our faculty on the differences of the different types of resources because they would sometimes get confused between a library ebook and OER and you know knowing what they could do like copyright wise with that. So we found that it's been helpful. Um, and then also to add our design tier this year. And then um, just a quick note about our um, grants this year. These are also an amazing partnership with um, my co-presenters and I and our teams together working to support these faculty projects. Um, so you can see all of the different colleges that um, we awarded design grants. We have four design grants. One of those was a group grant, and we're really excited about that. Um, and we're working with um, Academic Innovation, Rachel Elliott, who, who works with Claudia and Myra um, and me um, on uh, helping you know, provide guidance around instructional design and, and all of that with these projects. So we're really excited about these um these design projects to and provide a closer look to uh, the teaching and learning image program some of the goals that we wanted to achieve through this program are uh, to focus on equitable learning experiences use oers to create learning pathways and nurture students interests create more relevant and up-to-date materials create synergy between OERs, pedagogical innovation, and inclusive teaching, and then use OERs as an opportunity for students to co-create knowledge and be more engaged in the learning experience. So just a, a snapshot of some of the projects that uh, we, we funded with the Teaching and Learning Image program. Um, if we can uh, please take a look to the next slide we would like to highlight four projects. The first one is with Dr. Olesia Kislev, Teaching Foundations of Language Science to Improve Teacher Preparation. And the instructor for this course used OERs to, uh, to provide content to the students. Uh, Dr. Uh, Judy Okpala, Reshaping Film Genre on Online Learning. Dr. Mimi Yu, Interactive Learning through Authoring with Online Tools and Dr. David Huenlich, the Texas German experience of San Antonio. So how faculty and students use the OERs. In some of these courses, um, of course, content we're creating through OERs created directly from the, the faculty. And then students were also engaged in creating some of the resources. For example, with the interactive learning through authoring with online tools, students were creating artifacts and they were sharing these artifacts uh, uh, with their classmates. Or with the Texas German experience of San Antonio, students uh, created an app um, and included different content they were uh, creating through interviews and um, through um, some uh, field trip in San Antonio to identify uh, German landmarks. So it was uh, it was a way to create OERs, but also to engage our students. Okay, so I will pass it um, to um, to Mayra. Or, uh, oh no, sorry, <laughs> just one more thing. As an example of collaboration uh, that we had with uh, the library and uh, Dian and Dian's team, uh, we would like to talk about a project that uh, included the creation of an OER for a science course. And uh, we would like to share the quote of the instructor teaching the course. So having a free or low cost textbook means students would have their materials on day one. And this is one of the most important things that we also observe has an impact on reducing, for example, the FW rate because students have access to the material since the beginning of the semester. This will make a significant impact on student readiness. My vision is that OER in my discipline can be incorporated into the course without the students having to hunt for them or look for lower price alternatives and possibly risk not having the materials. So we can see how uh, including OERs into the course design is one of the 
uh, most important um, components for inclusive learning experiences for our students. Hi, y'all. As the timekeeper, I need to let you know it's about time to wrap up so we can stay on schedule. Do we have like 30 seconds? Yes, go for it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, this particular slide, um, I'll go really fast, but this was one of our um, uh, coordinating board grants that we received. Um, it was a development grant and it was partnership between two of our faculty that are pictured on the slide, um, Christina and Darren, and then a um, faculty member from, um, I believe it was Palo Alto. Um, and really excited about this. Um, you can see their quotes and read them and we're going to share, we have already shared our slides. So you'll be able to take a closer look at those quotes later. And just to conclude the, uh, the presentation, uh, aside from collaborating for course design, we are also engaging our faculty and we're planning a faculty panel on OER and engagement so that we will reach out to our faculty population and uh, promote OER's uh, broader. All right, this concludes our uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And do you have any questions? Um, there was one question in the chat. Clint asked, was the library staff the entrepreneur behind this program? Where did the initiative come from? Um, you know, it's one of the, this is one of those things that I feel like both of our teams have been working on for a while. Um, the, um, but the, we have, two distinct um, grant programs. So the uh, Adoptive Free Textbook Grant is through the library and then um, Academic Innovation has Teaching and Learning Reimagined Grants. So we're, I feel like we've, we've been um, starting to just become, it's become more of a formal thing, but I feel like we've been doing it, both of our teams for quite some time and assisting faculty with adopting OER. Does that help answer that question? And if you want to add anything, Claudia and Myra, too, please do. John, did oh, yeah, I thought I saw you in? Yeah, no, and you're good, Ursula. I appreciate you. And I, I have a presentation later on, like in an hour. But I, um, for Houston College, I'm part of a fellowship of ten faculty that got selected to be a cohort. Um, that's a year-long program, and one of the things that we're going to be doing that I want to do is an OER showcase. And Claudia, Myra, and then Deanna, I have your contact info. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, I'll reach out to you like later on in the week and then just see about your availability that you can come down to Houston College. Houston's the third largest metropolitan area in the United States beyond Miami-Dade and LA. And so I'm trying to raise the OER awareness um, you know, for our students because they're, they're the most in need and everything. So um, I'll, I'll reach out to you if you don't mind. Um, it's more like a plug for the fellowship uh, and everything. So, um, and uh, I just want you to hear my voice and remember that, uh, you know, when a Houston College email comes through, it'll be me, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> thank that you. Would, absolutely, thank you. No yes, worries, I, I, I like some of your work is so innovative and very progressive. And I know the life of a full-time faculty, um, you know, this is kind of like your passion project and something you really, really believe in. And it's very beneficial for our population and who are serving and everything. So I'm a big fan, you know? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my very first OER anything was at UTSA and, and I saw a presentation by you, Deanne. So to me, it's so exciting to see everything that you guys are, that you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you presenting. And um, for the attendees, we're gonna have a four minute break. And then the next presentation will start at 2.50 and it's exploring the value of open educational labor. And you can stick around or you can step away whatever you feel most comfortable with. All right. So welcome to this afternoon session um, for this presentation is exploring the value of open education and labor and take it away presenter. Okay, hi, I'm April. Um, I'm an MLS student at Indiana U University of Bloomington. Um, so my presentation exploring the value of open education labor. 
Um, so I mainly want to ask how the labor involved in OER creation, discovery, and dissemination should be valued by institutions and students. Um, so this is a more exploratory presentation. My goal is to mainly ask questions um, to, to promote thinking about not only how labor can be valued in terms of compensation, but also about how these ideas of OER labor and value are affected by their institutional context. Um, and so I think we can think about labor not only from the point of view of the people producing OER, but in terms of what we might think of as the consumers or the audience, um, in other words, the students, um, and how does this notion of a value kind of affect both sides, and how do the specificities of OER affect labor and value? Um, so I want to ask, um, in terms of valuing OER labor, is the goal of affordability for students compatible with the fact that OER labor is often free, underpaid, or underrecognized? Um, so, you know, we think of affordability in terms of equity and access, but it's kind of a bit of a paradox how on the other side that labor might be undervalued. Um, and I'm also taking this kind of theoretical concept of immaterial labor, um, because I think it particularly illuminates these issues, um, especially when it comes to OER. Um, so I'm taking this idea of immaterial labor from this Italian thinker, Maurizio Lazzarato. Um, so he defines immaterial labor as the labor that produces the informational and cultural content of the commodity. Um, so it's immaterial because, you know, it's not a product that you can see and touch. It's this more kind of like, you know, information and, and culture. We can think of how that's immaterial. Um, and he also says that in the context of immaterial labor, it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish leisure time from um, free time. And immaterial labor creates first and foremost a social relationship. Um, and so I think his ideas are really interesting when put into conversation with OER, because I think we can all think about how there's this confusion between free time and work time when it comes to OER production, even if it's compensated by something like a grant or a stipend. Um, you know, we expect faculty and others developing OER to kind of fit it in among their other responsibilities, especially teaching and research, and all of those responsibilities might overlap. So how do you distinguish OER labor in particular, aside from all of those other things, as well as from the emotional or intellectual investment they might feel in it? I think especially we might think of it emotionally as a service for students. Um, which might mystify the labor involved and kind of make it invisible. Um, and so this quote from Almeida, uh, she wrote an article on OER. So she says that this relegation of OER to the status of the immaterial suggests both a process of liberation from a corporeal context and an ideological diminishment. Uh, further erodes the means we have for measuring or recognizing the labor involved. Um, and so again, she kind of takes this idea of immateriality, um, and we can also apply it to the fact that like OER by design are online resources, and so they are literally immaterial. Um, and she kind of plays with the meaning of the word immaterial, like that can also refer to something that's unimportant um, or lacks value. So again, it kind of contributes to, you know, this kind of risk that we take that the lack of the physical form and the invisibility of the labor um, can create an impression um, that it's maybe of lesser value. Um, so I think in thinking about the immaterial labor of OER, um, obviously these issues are not like unique to OER, most information and culture workers kind of have these same issues where their labor is invisible or it becomes confused with their subjectivity. But I think OER in particular um, kind of like relates to these issues because of some of its specific characteristics. Um, so in analyzing the labor relationship, we wanna ask who are the producers and who are the consumers? Um, so these are free openly licensed resources. They're meant to be free. They're not meant to be commodities that are paid for. So what kind of implications does that have for the way we think about valuing labor? 
Um, and so I think thinking of who the producers are and the consumers, because of the context and definition of OER, it can be a little difficult to grasp. So um, producers would involve not only who's attributed as the author of the OER, but the librarians involved, instructional designers, um, graduate students like myself, et cetera. And then when we get into open licenses, that kind of disrupts this traditional notion of intellectual property that we often um, apply to cultural goods. And so again, that kind of confuses in terms of like who is really the producer when these open licenses enable remixing the resources. Um, and we can think of students as the consumers, but because OER do aim to get away from this kind of for-profit textbook publishing, um, I think we should ask like, you know, is it really right to think of students as the consumers? But then if we're going to value the labor, how else can we think about it? Um, and so I think all these questions are kind of hard to answer, but we're thinking about when it comes to defining the so-called value of OER. Um, and that leads into thinking about how the, the fairest way to compensate the work. Um, and I think, um, especially in the context of academia, this gets really tricky because as we all know, academia doesn't always compensate directly in terms of money, um, but in other ways. Um, so that leads to my next point about how OER labor fits, not only within the context of academia and its so-called prestige economy, but also what we might define as academic capitalism or the neoliberalization of higher education. So there are these trends in academia where it's maybe, um, you know, exceeding to capitalist values or neoliberalize, but the whole mission of OER in making education free and open um, can be in conflict with that. Um, so to kind of define my terms, um, what I'm talking about here. So academic capitalism deals with market and market-like behaviors of universities and faculty. Um, and neoliberal rhetoric in terms of like, you know, the self is a brand, you're an entrepreneur, um, it's a very individualistic approach. Um, we can think of how this can be used as commercial value and social values. And so in thinking about OER as an alternative to, um, you know, for-profit textbooks, um, you know, this confusion between commercial value and social value can get really tricky. Um, and so this kind of like, I think this is the context we're dealing with now where academic institutions and workers are positioned as entrepreneurs and students are positioned as consumers. So um, faculty who are working on OER, um, you know, both librarians and like professors, you know, they need to think of themselves as a brand within the e academy. So they're doing a lot of things for academic capital or prestige, um, maybe instead of like, you know, just for money. So working on something because it's a line on your CV and how it contributes to promotion and tenure might be more important than a grant. Um, and two, thinking about the students as consumers, I think a lot of them do think of themselves as customers of the university or the university appeals to them in that way where they feel like they want to be satisfied for what they're paying for or their loans are paying for. Um, and so I think the openness and affordability of OER definitely pushes back against these trends, but I think we also need to kind of be aware of and think about how they might affect the ways that we value OER and present them to students. So like I said, in many ways, OER disrupts this neoliberalization because um, you know, the profit-driven textbook publishing industry, it kind of takes away power from them because it's an alternative to it, but it also disrupts it in terms of um, disrupting this idea of intellectual property. Um, and I think that's what a lot of the prestige economy relies on. You know, I own this knowledge, um, uh, it's attributed to me. And so the openness of OER um, is kind of a different take on that. Um, but still, like, um, faculty and librarians have to navigate within this economy. And so the immaterial labor or the invisible labor of OER becomes subject to that prestige economy of academia. So faculty incentives and priorities might depend a lot on their position within the academy. Um, you know, a more tenure track 
professor might choose to spend more time on a peer-reviewed research article because that what's, that's what counts towards tenure. Um, and someone who's ad, like an adjunct faculty, they might have more time to work on OER or they would see it as service, but they're already marginalized within the academy. They're already underpaid. So is it really fair to ask them to do this labor for you know compensation that might not be adequate to the work involved? Um, and so Chrisinger and White have already explored this, but I feel like it merits further exploration about how our OER labor relates to promotion and tenure because those are so important for faculty. Um, and the other thing too, from the student side is that too much emphasis on cost savings um, could reinforce the student as consumer model. You know, you might think of it as like, oh yeah, they're a happy customer because they're getting this resource for free or it's on sale. Um, but that doesn't really push back against this perception of them as a consumer, which, you know, if we're thinking that we're here for them to learn um, and, you know, become developed citizens, um, that's clearly problematic. All right, so um, that leads into the question of OER's value in pedagogy. And I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, we're ultimately making these for students and hoping that it helps with not only affordability, but their learning. Um, but because it is different than what they might think of as a traditional textbook, do they really recognize the value of OER? And can we relate this question to how we teach them? Um, so I think, and I mean, I don't know if there are studies out here about student attitudes towards OER. Like I know there probably are some, but in terms of like the value um, we can think about how students who might be accustomed to purchasing textbooks um, and they, who might view themselves as consumers of their university education, if they fully appreciate the value of OER. Um, so they're navigating this context where you're paying a ton of money for a textbook and then someone gives you one for free um, and you appreciate not spending the money, but at the same time, because you didn't spend that money on it, you might see it as worthless. Um, so just anecdotally, there's the view that OER are not real textbooks. Um, in our program, um, one of the instructors who created her own OER reported that a few students told her, oh, this isn't a real textbook. And so I don't know the context for them saying that, but I think it's really interesting to think about how some students do have that perception and saying it's a, not a real textbook, like clearly shows that they're valuing it in a different way. Um, and so I think it's worth exploring, like, do they think it because think that because it's free or because it's not an actual physical book? Um, are they able to distinguish it from other online sources? Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of students, they see something online and they just think like, oh, this is a thing on the internet. And so how is our OER positioned within that? Um, especially, you know, do they understand the difference between an openly licensed OER and a pirated textbook that's illegal? Um, and so I think this is really a question of expertise because expertise is a big part of that immaterial labor. It can be measured in certain ways, but it's hard to put a monetary value on that. And so in terms of students valuing OER, um, the value isn't necessarily in the money, but it's in the expertise. Um, and so the question is, how can that be conveyed to students and in what ways are, is that important? All right, so um, I'm gonna wrap up with talking about some potential solutions to some of these questions. Um, so first of all, valuing immaterial labor. Clearly, even though this labor isn't quite material or it's invisible, making it visible through appropriate compensation and attribution is really important as much as possible. Um, and White points out that this is not a gift economy. So even though we might see it as an act of service to students, that shouldn't devalue our own labor. Um, and part of that is also responding to the context of academia and the so-called prestige economy. Um, so I think the openness of OER is really important and we can emphasize that that's not quite the same as free. Um, we can also think about how this might interrogate the notion of intellectual property um, 
you know, instead of thinking of knowledge as something that's owned, we can think of it more as like a commons. Um, and OER is a good way to think about that along with open access. Um, and the other main thing is advocating for institutional recognition of OER labor and tenure and promotion documents. Um, and so I think that's something where librarians and other OER advocates could have a lot of power. Um, I'm citing this Doers 3 document. Um, and I, I, that's really useful. It's like a matrix of how faculty can kind of cite OER creation um, in their PNT documents, not only as, as service, but also potentially as research. Um, so I think that's a really good way of like valuing that labor in a way that goes beyond monetary compensation. Um, and then integrating OER value in labor and pedagogy. I think OER is a really good opportunity for helping students to think about information literacy more critically. Um, so this would vary across disciplines, but I think every discipline, you know, it's important to kind of think about what expertise is in that discipline and who the authorities are. Um, so I have these three frames from the framework listed here. Authority is constructed and contextual. Information has value and scholarship is conversation. Um, I think we can all see how OER value relates to all of those. So what makes an OER authoritative compared to something else on the internet? And can we think of information as having value beyond just like you paying for a textbook? Um, and we can also relate this to open pedagogy because it can invite students to kind of think about like how we attribute intellectual labor and what kind of values apply to that. Though I know there are also other labor issues related to open pedagogy that I can't really get into here, but um, I think thinking of it in terms of labor and value is a really good entry point to that. Um, so to wrap up, I think these are all like really difficult, complicated questions and OER is kind of like, a weird unique thing because it's not really a commodity but we still want to value it um, but i think it also really gives a good opportunity for um pushing back against some of those trends of like neoliberal higher education that i talked about um and i think it can really um do a lot when it's integrated with that information literacy framework so thank you Wonderful. Thank you for this incredible presentation. Um, it's so thought provoking and dovetails so well with uh, the keynote presentation. Um, a lot to think about here. Thank you uh, for sharing this. And um, I will definitely check out this, this Google uh, slide deck afterwards. I, I ask um, if there was a question. Let's see. Um, I do not see, uh, would like to see pointers to the limitations of open pedagogy. <laughs> we have one minute. Um, if you could answer okay. that in one minute. I think the main thing about open pedagogy, it's by DeRosa and I don't know how to say his last name, Gianji, but um, they talk about like the potential of it, but they also acknowledge the limits where students might be seen as cheap or free labor. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for this incredible presentation. Um, and um, yeah, everyone, um, we will have our next presentation starting at 3.15, um, Open International Pol Political Economy, a student authored textbook. Um, and there's some great comments by that present presenter about how this relates to what April just, just spoke about. So thank you so much, April, for your time and your presentation and your scholarship. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. And folks, you can stick around. Um, we're gonna pause the recording and then we'll restart it. And we will have our new moderator, Anna. <laughs> you can hear me all right. I will go ahead and switch over to my presentation, but um, I appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, what I want to do today is just to walk you through my own experience, which has had one iteration 
of working with students on uh, an open um, educational resource, which uh, I'm calling a textbook, which, but which I think in the long run, I have hopes that it's gonna be something more than that. Uh, I'm a professor of political science and public policy and political economy at UT Dallas. And just to give you a sense of where this course falls, I, I did like a little uh, quick slide here on the subfields in political science. Uh, one of my points here is that I'm not teaching one of the big uh, government classes that has lots of enrollments. So I have about 60 to 80 students in this class every year. But it is, uh, but international political economy is a class that is taught across lots of different institutions. It is a common uh, course within political science departments. Of course, it depends on who has what specialty and all that sort of thing, how big the department is. Uh, but there is a community of scholars internationally that works on this topic. And so ultimately, that is going to be relevant for, for where I'm headed uh, with this. But my class is in uh, international political economy. Um, and I've taught this for a long time. I don't want to date myself, but um, oh, well over a decade. And so I wanted to um, basically change textbooks, right? I was a little bit uh, frustrated about the textbook that I had been using, which is not hugely expensive. And so cost was not the biggest issue for me in trying to make the choice for an open uh, textbook and moving towards uh, OER in general. But I know that it is the biggest uh, reason that is that OER is frequently mentioned. And so I'm gonna try today to focus on some of the other reasons that I think open educational resources are useful. So I've also written a, another textbook that I use for a different class. It went through the usual channels and got published at uh, Oxford University Press, which is awesome. Uh, and I did that with a guy that's written many, many textbooks or many, many books over the years. Um, so I've had that experience and I decided that maybe I didn't want to do that again, but I'll, uh, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But Part of the reason for that is that I, I do think that um, many of us are concerned with the role that these publishing houses play, especially when it comes to textbooks and setting up um, you know, what gets in, who gets to, to publish those, and most importantly, what they cost. So eroding the institutional paywall is this notion of trying to make those books more freely available to students, but not just within the institution, right? potentially worldwide, uh, and so to make the content of the course available uh, to a much broader audience. Third thing for me in international political economy that's important is speeding up the production process, by which I mean turning around uh, editions of the textbook faster. The one that I was using, you know, China has been rising quite quickly in the world economy, and its models and discussion of China were at least a decade overdue for uh, revising. And so I got kind of frustrated with that. Of course, I can modify that in a lecture or whatever else, but just having a faster turnaround time, I think is, is potentially useful here as well. But for, for me, the two most important things for the students in particular are these last, the fourth and fifth bullet points here, making assignments durable. What, what I mean by that is taking an assignment that a student has in a semester and sees as busy work and turns it into a meaningful uh, experience that they're doing for the next generation of students. We're gonna use my textbook the next time around. So writing it once is not just a one-off project. It's something that is gonna stick around for a long time and be uh, influential in its own right. And I found that students really liked that idea. And I think it made them try harder. Uh, one of the things that I liked about this experience was that uh, we were all probably experiencing students without much energy in the spring. And this, this assignment got them going uh, better than anything else I've seen uh, during our COVID, uh, during our pandemic times. And so uh, I think that that's why. I think that they saw it as something that had lasting value. Uh, eventually, I think it will also turn up that the textbook reflects uh, the diversity of my students and their experiences, many of which are related to international economics and to international politics. And so I hope that those filter in more in the next iterations of the textbook. Um, and then eventually what I'd like to do is to go beyond just the textbook model with text and images and to have interactive learning modules that are a lot more interactive as, as most of you know, that's, that's kind of a, an advantage for doing things natively on, on the web to begin with. Now, so I did this thing called open ped pedagogy, at least I tried to, and I think that there are some real questions about how far you can go with students, depending on the topic. Uh, and so let me just kind of tell you what, what I did um, as the solutions to try to limit 
the uh, the vast potential expanses of open pedagogy and to try to structure it in a way that my students would find doable. Uh, so open pedagogy, if you know the terms, just teaching with OER materials, but then also actively contributing to them. So I had a database of open access uh, materials that they could they could use, but I wanted to get those more um, centralized and organized with the course content. And so uh, the first thing I, I faced was, could I actually pull together a textbook with what was out there already? And I quickly decided, no, not in this field. So I said, we're going to write the textbook. How did we do that? I uh, basically, uh, uh, I chose the topics that needed to be in the textbook. So I had a list of chapters um, and I chose the kind of license that we were gonna use for the textbook. And that was gonna be the non-commercial Creative Commons license. Uh, I also decided that I didn't want to just immediately include all the student names as authors because that potentially poses FERPA problems. And so I had them opt into being recognized in the book itself. They also had an option of a pseudonym, which potentially poses, poses problems, I know, but I, I said it had to be a reasonable uh, name. And I actually have the FERPA waiver that I used for that opt-in opt here in a slide or two, if you want to actually see that. Uh, for the content of the chapters themselves, I encouraged the groups to, uh, to go ahead and use my lecture as a baseline, but then to go out and do more research, particularly peer, focusing on peer-reviewed uh, publications that they could incorporate into the chapters and move it in their own directions. Now, first time around, we didn't have too many students that did that, but ultimately I think that there's gonna be a lot more room for creativity and to kind of uh, include, you know, small case studies on particular things, exchange rate crises or whatever um, that students have had experiences with. And so I think that will get um, better over time. This is the list of assignments I gave that were related to the textbook in class. They were not all the assignments from the class, but the first one that I used at the recommendation of this Mays and DeRosa uh, book is a, a low stakes, small scale assignment, and it was individual. So I asked students to basically do what amounts to kind of a Wikipedia entry or a very small uh, encyclopedia entry on one concept from the section of the class on international trade. And I've got those, and so I guess I can have that as a, as a glossary in the book. At this point, I haven't even really thought about how to use that, but it was the main thing was to get them kind of comfortable writing and, and to get um, comfortable looking at each other's work, uh, getting some peer reviews and that sort of thing. The big assignment was the second one where I assigned groups. I gave I give you the site here for what I used as the technique to assign groups. I did not allow students to select their own groups. Uh, that sort of thing. And I did um, I, I did exactly what Oakley and company here recommend in terms of trying to figure out what's the best way to organize those. I did specify a list of requirements for the chapters. So there was a common kind of structure across the uh, chapters. They had to have an introduction and a conclusion, for example. Uh, and then I did save quite a few classes at, towards the end of the semester so that the students could work together. So it was not a completely out of class assignment. There was a fair amount of in-class time built into it. And so that was where the textbook came from was assignment three, uh, sorry, assignment two. And then at the very end of the class, uh, this was a uh, not a throwaway because I told them it was coming all semester, but I had them just uh, submit a short uh, paragraph or sentence even about an idea for how to make the book interactive. And so I gave them some examples of that. And I've got that list, which again is hopefully going to be something we can work on in the future as this thing goes forward. So speaking of going forward, what I've got right now are 15 chapters of the textbook, uh, some of which need some pretty decent editing uh, before I use them again in the spring. But I happen to teach a graduate class on the same subject, on international political economy, and that's happening right now. So one of the things I'm using is this idea that my students um, have written something and it needs uh, some element of peer review before it really is, you know, ready for an external audience, more or less. And so I'm having my grad students serve as the peer reviewers. Now, this is something that they work on uh, in regards to the other stuff they do in my class anyway. They all learn to review books and articles as part of that class. And so it's a natural fit for what I'm asking them to do. Um, and I think it will be helpful then to have a written review that the next iteration of undergraduates get 
on the chapter they've been assigned. Uh, and so this becomes an iterative process, at least that's how I have, an, have, uh, have it in my head, uh, that the graduate students write the reviews and the undergrads receive those reviews. And then when they start revising the chapters that they've been assigned the next time around, uh, it, this works together. And so we have kind of a workflow here that I hope will result in the, the continual improvement of the textbook. And that is, uh, that's ultimately where I'm, I'm headed. Um, I will say one other thing, and that is just kind of next steps. So it is, <laughs> I, I started the whole process of making this thing public. The first chapter is ready to go on Pressbooks. And then of course, Pressbooks announced their change in, uh, in subscription. And so I'm kind of at a current loss. I'm trying to get, I, I'm really jealous of what UTSA was describing. I have had help from other people at UTD and I really appreciate uh, Rupa and Sasha if they're in the audience today. Uh, but we don't have the kind of university-wide structure that UTSA has. And so I've been trying to convince the university that we need some of those things before I decide exactly how to make this public uh, going forward. So any advice on that front would be welcome. And then ultimately, I don't want this to be just a UTD project. I want it to be something that involves other IPE scholars around the world and ideally is used in the classes that they're teaching with their students contributing to uh, the text as we go forward and to the interactive elements and so on. So I, I hope this is a multi-year project that will be uh, long lasting and will uh, will not just grow in its number of UTD students, but will expand internationally and allow us to get lots of different um, ideas and perspectives into the book while still being uh, useful for its purposes. So that's what I have. I will go ahead and flash my two slides up here. The next one is, uh, oh, and that's my contact information. Uh, the next one is the FERPA waiver. And I think these slides are made available to everybody. Is that right, uh, Anna? Uh, yes, I believe so. And there will be a recording that will be available. Oh, that's right. We've got the recording. Okay, great. So I'll stop there and I do welcome some, some Q&A on this. I, I'm looking for some wisdom uh, as I go forward on the project. So if folks are welcome to unmute themselves and just ask, or if anybody wants to drop a question in the chat, that of course is welcome as well. Thanks about the OERTX. I've already got uh, the first chapter up there. So I was part of the, the uh, creators workshop this summer. And that's what allowed us to, to do that. And it is a good resource, but I, I'm worried that it's, um, I don't, I, I guess I don't want to define it just for Texas audiences. And I know that's not, I know it's, it's public, but I, um, I was hoping to use the uh, Pressbooks platform as, a moth, uh, as an authoring tool. And so that was kind of the disappointment with, uh, I think UTD is not going forward with that as a subscription service, so. Uh, Clint, I wanted to ask uh, um, just how are your students responding to the fact that you're um, having them be a part of the process to create text for the future classes and everything. Are they really excited for it? Or are they really enthused for it? I mean, it sounds like an excellent idea. Well, you can imagine that I got different responses from different students, but some were quite enthusiastic and really did great work on the chapters. Um, I have two chapters that I have section that you can tell that the group of three students basically like divided the chapter up and it varies dramatically in quality. So I've got two chapters that really have a section that is gonna require me to go back and probably rewrite it before I can give it to the students uh, with some plagiarism issues and that sort of thing. Um, but most of them turned out better than I expected. And so I would say 13 out of 15 chapters resulted in students taking it seriously and being able to work together and coming up with a product that I thought is at least good enough for the next class. And then I think with this iterative, pro iterative process that I was talking about, once it goes through one iteration, I'm gonna feel a lot more comfortable uh, throwing it out there and making it something that, uh, that we can provide to a lot of people. Yeah. Thank you for that question, John. No worries, I appreciate it. Thank you, Quinn. And then we have a question from the chat. Uh, did any of your students have any reservations about publishing their content openly? If so, how did you respond to those concerns? So the FERPA waiver, I think, 
um, which was really more than that, right? The, the opt in on putting their own name on the content, um, it, gi it give the, gives them a little bit of an out so that if they don't want to, um, to do that or if they have any sort of concerns about the privacy, then they don't have to, right? Um, there were, I think people were genuinely nervous early on about whether they could come up, they could write something that would be a quality textbook chapter. And I think my show, my kind of having them focus on the lectures helped because it gave them at least a superstructure to go with, right? And some basic content that they could put in there. And then uh, if they wanted to be uh, a little more creative and and go with their own directions, then they could do that. So, so I think I think ultimately, the format that I came up with was helpful. I'm sure that it didn't resolve all the problems, um, and I'm still not I'm I'm not sure that I gave enough room for creativity the first time around. But I hope that that will be the case in the future, and I think that's an important question for to address that and and to ensure that students want to do that. So actually, I have a question. When you okay. said there were some plagiarism issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it the case of students just copying and pasting and not including citations or? Yeah, so I used turnitin.com uh, for our submissions of the chapters. And I tend to use that on exams and all kinds of stuff anyway, uh, because it is so easy. It just is, you know, makes it pretty straightforward to see when that's happening. And most of the time it's not an issue. Uh, and in all the other chapters, it wasn't. But I've got two chapters that I mentioned before, sections of it where very clearly they lifted, I would say it's more than what you described. I would say that they're pulling multiple paragraphs um, and not citing and that sort of thing. Uh, and um, so, you know, again, it's because the groups didn't really gel and one person never kind of bought in. And so I got to do something next time around, I think, to try to bring uh, to bring the bottom end of, of the writers up and to try to involve uh, get their buy-in a little bit more. You know, I mean, UTD students like many of yours are working full-time or have, you know, families at home, all that sort of thing. And I know that their time outside of class can be constrained. And so, you know, allowing for lots of time to write in class, I think should should address that, right? But it, at least this time it didn't fully. So. It is. So can I just go back then to my uh, my question, my reasons for using the uh, textbook themselves? Uh, so I know that April has, has heard of this concept of open pedagogy. Just curious if anybody else has had experience with it or whether you know they've structured things differently, if that's the case. And if so, uh, I would love to learn uh, from that. Clearly this DeRosa guy is the one to, to read. Um, I can pipe in and just say um, some of our projects at UTSA, I think, have the potential for this. And one of our design grants through the library, the Adopted Free Textbook grants, and then there were several that Claudia, my colleague, mentioned um, mm -hmm. that have great potential for that. But um, there's only one where um, our faculty are having their student, or the, and it's really having um, like seniors. Uh, they're recording videos for freshmen because it's for um, a first year class. And so students are a part of it, but it's not the students in the class. So we're not quite there yet, but you are doing amazing work. This is really exciting to see. I'm just making my students do the work, right? That's where I thought April might jump in here and and, uh, and talk to me about my free labor that I'm using. But, you know, I was really interested in her talk because I I can see why uh, a critique of OER and particularly of open pedagogy would go there, and I understand that. But it was the participation in the learning process, I think, that made it uh, useful the first time through. And and my grad students seem also interested in looking at what's out there. So, I mean, lo looking at what my other students have done. So I, I've thus far, I at least have not encountered that in the classroom. So. Yeah. And with that perfect timing, we have five seconds left, actually, technically, or at least we did when I started speaking that. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pause. Appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for moderating. Appreciate it. Thanks for 
um, you know, just including my proposal in this uh, very nice, prestigious. Uh, the chancellor invited an open call for everyone at Houston College, so I thought I would take uh, the initiative and and be a part of it. I'm part of a, a innovative fellowship over at Houston College, and we're actually looking at possibly creating a showcase. So I might reach out to some of my colleagues that I've seen uh, throughout the day and everything, and just uh, invite you to a virtual uh, sort of showcase for our fellowship and. We have a very innovative um, like fellowship and it's it constitutes um, like only around 10 faculty, like I said, which I'm one of them. And it's an innovative fellow. It's it's a very inclusive program. We meet every Friday for around five hours every Friday. And it's across disciplines. And one of the things we're tasked to do is, is to create a showcase. And one of the things I'm probably focusing on is OER, uh, something I've been heavily involved in uh, when I was full time in California and also coming out to Houston College, uh, you know, completing my first year just recently and everything. One of the things um, we worked with, um, and uh, this is the, the slide uh, that I uploaded and uh, we worked with where we were tasked with creating uh, communication at Houston Community College and focusing on student success and effective communication. And I do want to talk about open pedagogy because in my second uh, slide presentation, I'll be talk talking about our career workforce population, which is 60 to 80 percent of our student population. And um, a lot of our students um, that I've had experience with in California um, are formerly incarcerated. So I'll be speaking about that in a little bit, but some of the work we've done with Achieving the Dream in Texas, also in California, um, is we've been having to align a lot of the policies and practices to remove barriers um, for our student population. And one of the things that we've been tasked with is creating student engagement. And I've been aligning uh, with an OER handbook because I'm part of the co-requisite uh, component. Usually when our students come in, they have to take six units of math, six units of English, I'll, I'll be teaching the six units of English and also the reading writing integration. Um, but we've been tasked with specifically focusing on engagement, communication, uh, and then the fundamental aspects of the grant are focusing on resources and surveys. Um, and then obviously evidence gathering and artifact finding. Uh, do we do Do we have a clear, compelling vision for our students and how do we align those in relation to their priorities and focus on, you know, like taking away the whole ivory tower sort of experience and then help, helping students with their motivation and uh, helping them achieve their goals, whether it be certificate vocation or transfer, et cetera. So some of the aspects are, you know, some this is some of the work that we've looked at, uh, Chickering and Gamson, as well as time management, achievement, and organizing with clarity. And then uh clarity and transparency are we being clear about what we're doing and what we're talking about and how are we how are we communicating that sense of transparency with focusing with our students um as well as um regarding like different discussions with our different demographics and different population while building that sense of inclusivity with our rapport with our students um are we in love with our content are we displays displaying enthusiasm with what we share and how we share it and the feedback that we have with our students. So um, that's an introductory um, like slide uh, and all. And so um, the other one, which is uh, tied in with some of the work that, uh, that I've been working on is um, helping my students build like those uh, basic skills because uh, at Houston College, we are working with a lot of students that um, have foster youth, non-traditional background. Our median age is around early 30s with several children. Most of our uh, students are people of color. Most of them are working several jobs. Um, so some of the work I've, I've been working with is, is in terms of experiential uh, open pedagogy, such as having my students um, build on databases and looking at OER with in relation to building a, a career workforce uh, type of manual for the OER. And so project-based learning is a huge consideration because we're working on creating uh, students to write research papers and focusing on those scholarly databases. Um, and I work hand in hand with uh, a lot of the fellows that I'm already in for a year, uh, but also a lot of the librarians, um, I work hand in hand with them to kind of help students with uh, basic research skills. And then this is the part where 
kind of ties in with uh, Clint's uh, work, I feel like, just because they got to be working uh, 20 hours and um, connecting either with uh, things that they're already working on, like internships, uh, workforce development, work study, et cetera. And then they, they have to create some sort of work log and they also need to write about it. And that's where all the research component comes from. Um, I've developed OER materials in California for their acceleration project where I had to create a manual across the districts and also uh, central and southern California. Uh, and then this is the CTE component that I was originally talking about in relation to helping our students because we have a huge uh, workforce population, which are foster youth, older adults, non-traditional background. Um, many of the students are, are, are single parents. Um, many of them are just uh, looking at different programs and I'll highlight some of those programs um, in some upcoming slides, but you know, offering second chances, giving them up other opportunities, so on and so forth. Um, automotive being one of those, um, uh, one of the programs that we're offering. And so they can basically come and complete the program and then they can join any one of the dealers and be a master mechanic. Uh, solar is coming obviously because of Elon Musk in Texas. And, you know, solar is a huge component in relation to our workforce um, and all. And then nursing, we have a lot of nursing students that are um, looking at nursing school specifically and then getting through uh, some of their co-workers like courses such as math and English. And English and math are graded as heavily to, to get in the nursing program as anatomy and physiology and chemistry and some of the other sciences. So those are some of the essential skills and phlebotomy, uh, IV therapy, and some of the nurse assistant, et cetera. And so, well, we have a huge welding population. And then that welding population, uh, you know, it's more like a certificate vocational type of a degree, but hand in hand, they have to get through uh, the first uh, year. And it's a lot of co-rec, six units of math, six units of English. And um, it, 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 it comes to be like six to eight hours a week. And I usually tell my students that they have to double that eight to 12 to 24 hours, depending on their workload and what they have to do and everything. So it's, it's, um, it's a continual discussion. And we do have a fire program as well. A lot of our students are, are looking at opportunities. We have a state-of-the-art fire um, you know, uh, center. Houston College is 18 to 20 centers. We Every couple of months, we open up a new center. Um, like I said, Houston College is the third largest metropolitan area beyond. Miami-Dade is the largest. And then Los Angeles Community College Districts has, has seven different colleges. Um, and I, I used to be full-time uh, at Los Angeles uh, Harbor College um, and all before I came to Houston. So, uh, and then one of the things I, I took over, I, I created, I was tasked with uh, creating OER for the co-requisite. California had this acceleration where they did away with all the developmental uh, levels. We used to have three to five, depending on which institution you're at. And then and they basically, the chancellor at the time for uh, California Community Colleges did away with all the levels and we just had one English course. And so uh, I was able to create a OER manual with a lot of my uh, intra and inter district uh, colleagues, as well as some um, outside the, the college itself um, and all. And so here's some of what the initiative was in California. It's at the AB 705, um, you know, assembly bill. And, uh, and, you know, we can thank the chancellor for that. He was the former president at Long Beach City College and he's the first Latino um, and all. And so this is some of the work I did in California, which uh, I'm kind of sharing, but these are some of the things that we focused on. Processes of writing, you know, writing is cross-disciplinary writing. Uh, you know, if you're a police officer, if you're in fire science, if you're in nursing, uh, these are some of the interdisciplinary skills that follow you no matter where you go. And then modes of rhetoric, uh, critical thinking. Most of our students come in um, with little or no critical thinking. Um, you know, rote memorization, not not the higher aspects of Bloom's taxonomy, which is creation, synthesis, application. Uh, and then, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of the formerly incarcerated population, and so Luis Rodriguez was always running. Uh, him being a former, uh, you know, incarcerated person himself talks about. Uh, being a former gang member. Now he's a, you know, poet laureate. Uh, he has multiple publications across many different disciplines. And he's a, we actually went down to his cafe and he spoke about his former life. His, his, his son is actually institutionalized, which 
again, you know, and talking to him about that. And then Jeffrey Duncan Andrade is a, he's, he's a San Francisco teacher based out of Oakland, but he talks about the rose that grew from concrete, which is Tupac Shakur. Uh, he talks about the sense of vulnerability and uh, he's got a lot of webinars and he does a lot of guest speaking. He's a powerful, powerful speaker um, and uh, he's published a, a great deal as well. So I followed some of his work and um, he uses Tupac hip hop rap because um, again, Houston College has 66% people of color, you know, and all, mostly non-traditional students. And then one of the modes, um, you know, within the co-rec manual for the OER was teaching them rhetorical modes. And I would link up Thoreau and Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King, and each gener general generationally were um, preceptors for the following generation, Thoreau, and then Gandhi, and then Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, each, uh, looked at the previous as, as a way to uh, pass forward radical passivity, uh, themes of, you know, peace. And, um, you know, and so uh, that's, that's something that we would work towards. Um, and that's also part of the OER manual that we worked on as well with my colleagues. And these are some of the other aspects because a lot of our students have a lot of deficits in their first year, um, you know, and then they come in underprepared and we have to teach them the right academic discourse, right? And plagiarism is across all levels um, because again, there's this pressure to have to turn in something. Uh, and then coherence and cohesion being a part of that as well. And here's an example of one of my students writing, just I highlighted different colors for cohesion, coherence, and I, you know, that's also in the manual itself as well. Um, introductions and conclusions, um, structuring your essay, thesis statements, how to qualify an argument, you know, again, the different rhetorical modes, cause and effect, compare and contrast, argue one side, argue the other side, argue your side, issue, solution, call to action. Those are different rhetorical modes that you can look at. Um, and then Menendez versus Westminster, um, that's a huge, uh, that came before Brown versus, Brown versus the Board of Education. And, you know, Westminster, uh, it, the, the Menendez is uh, the original plaintiffs. Um, the, we had the original original descendants, the grand 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 descendants, come in and actually speak, um, and that was a wonderful experience for our students because again, here are people of color, Mexican Americans, Latin X. Uh, we are in Latino Heritage Month as well, so it, it again speaks to uh, the to the students and what we're focusing on MLA format in-text citations and research paper writing, which again, that's something, you know, is, is something that I, I tell my students, um, you know, we're at, we're, we're at the bibliography part of it right now. And, you know, I say it's something that you're gonna learn or you will learn for the rest of your career, because obviously even Clint talked about plagiarism with his undergrad and grad students. So um, it's a continual issue, critical analysis, critical thinking. Um, and then summarizing versus paraphrasing versus making an argument. Transitions, signal phrasing, keywords and writing prompts, test taking, note taking, Cornell notes, metacognition, time management, abstract versus concrete, reading strategies. And this is the formerly incarcerated. Um, a lot of the students um, were going through a pipeline of having to be uh, reinst reinstituted back into society. And that was a population that I had a lot of experience with. And, you know, uh, it's having to teach within the prisons and also uh, work with uh, them as they come back out. And that's a majority of our career workforce population and they're really into open pedagogy because it's very experiential very very experiential and um equity is being one of those aspects and this is one of the students and and he's actually um one of the proponents of a pipeline for the formerly incarcerated and he's created an entire network all throughout california he graduated berkeley uh, summa cum laude got, got a full ride to a phd and he does a whole guest speaking unit across the entire California. And so um, this was the picture 
that uh, he, he gave me when he just got out of prison. And then the former picture was the picture that he got booked, um, you know, when he got, got jumped into a gang and, and everything. And now he's a scholar. It's, it's pretty amazing, actually. So um, I think um, I'm, I'm at the 15 minute mark. So I'll go ahead and stop the presentation, right? Am I good with time, Anna? Is that right? Yes, that you were right at 15. Okay. Uh, so now we have five minutes for questions and we actually already have one question in the chat. Uh, Clint asks, what are the educational goals for the work log and what element does the student interaction contribute to that? I love that it's a multi-tiered question. <laughs> Clint, I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect with you and then uh, ask you to be a part of that showcase if you don't mind. So, um, and then, uh, but uh, one of the things, um, it's really specific to the student's career pathway. I mean, that's another big thing that's been big on not only in California, but also Texas, they're realigning all the pathways. And so that's the usually the project that I have my students work on is project-based learning, but then they have to keep a log of, um, you know, it's, I'm being conservative 20, 20 hours, but many of my students have 100 to 200 to 300 hours uh, per term because they just, are working uh, so much. Like for instance, one, uh, one of my students recently did a log for dental assisting and she's just trying to get as much experience as possible experientially so she can um, apply for a dental hygiene uh, college because dental assisting, um, like their, their median uh, salary per year is like 30 to 50,000, depending on how many gigs or how many part-time uh, jobs that they can get. And then when you get in a dental hygiene program and you're cert certificated and, mm -hmm. and you actually graduate, you're actually going to make twice as much as that. And so, um, and then to be full time as a dental hygiene um, hygienist in a, in, a, in a really reputable practice, you're making 60 to 80 to 100,000, depending on where you are and what state you are and everything. So that's an example right there. And then what element does the student interaction contribute? Uh, you know, I mean, the students, um, you know, they, in the very beginning of the semester, I can't say that they're happy that they have to keep a log, but, you know, um, at the very end, when everyone goes around and kind of shares about, like, um, what, what goes in, into the log, which is very reflective, uh, it allows for the students to kind of share their experiences, and, um, you know, and I, some of the students are actually very, I'm grateful for it because they are able to talk about, you know, their, their future career and resume building, cover letter, interviewing, um, you know, uh, and then bringing in different services, uh, you know, in terms of applying for scholarships, um, letters, letters of intent, um, you know, those are some of the other uh, skills that we're basically doing in relation to that. So in answer to your question, there's a lot of student interaction and most of my students, um, they, they appreciate that it's uh, realistic learning, you know, it's learning that they're going to actually be getting jobs or working in what field that they're already working. So they're enjoying it actually. So really great question. Do we have any other questions for John? We have about a little bit less than two minutes left. <laughs> All right, well, we can leave the room open for a few more minutes if people want to hang around and chat. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, John, for your presentation. And My thank pleasure. you to all of our other presenters. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and I hope to see you all tomorrow for our final day of our conference. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.